Okay, so uh, I'm excited about this morning. I know I'm excited every morning, uh, and uh, there's, there's a few reasons why. I get the opportunity to see you and hang out with you, the great people of the Collective Church. And uh, we also have a, a special announcement that we're going to make. But uh, really quick, man, if you're visiting with us today for the very first time, we just want you to know something. It means the absolute world to us that you are here. Now, let's give him a round of applause. Sure, the first time. Because here's the reality. We know that you could have been anywhere and you made the decision to be here. I don't care if you were forced here. I don't care if a significant uh, other dragged you here. You are here and we are so incredibly grateful to that. And we hope you enjoy your experience. And we love to connect with you after service. Uh, at the end of service, our hosts, Lena and Henry, will let you know how to do so. But one more time, give a round of applause to all of our first time guests. All right. Hey, so I have a very special announcement to make here at the Collective Church. Now, we are a new church. I don't know if you know that. Um, we are about two and a half years old. That's why we meet uh, in a basketball court. We don't have a building, uh, but the Lord knows. Amen. And so um, we're new, and uh, starting up this church was incredible because we had a great team of people. And uh, in that, some of those people ended up crossing over and coming on staff with us. And I don't know if you guys know who Pastor Kyle is, but Pastor Kyle... Uh, is stand, sitting right there, and uh, yeah, here at the Collective Church, when we say golf clap, you all clap, and so, you know, Pastor Kyle's been tasked with starting up a youth ministry. He's also simultaneously been the, one of our associate pastors here at the Collective Church, which means he's helping me out a lot on the back end on the different ministries here and building of the different ministries, and Pastor Kyle was tasked to start a youth group, and not only start a youth group, to sustain a youth group, and not only sustain a youth group, but to grow this youth group, and um, I know what it's like to start a youth group. It's absolutely hard. I think it's harder than church planning. And uh, he's done an incredible job. Um, and we've come to a point in where we see that Pastor Kyle is um, going to be stepping into other roles here at the Collective Church, uh, being more focused on associate pastoring here at the church. And with that, it's going to leave a void in our youth department. But I just want you to know that we're not left with a vo void for very long. And uh, today I want to introduce a very special couple that's going to be taking over as the youth directors at the Collective Church. So will you join me in welcoming Larry and Desiree to the stage, ladies and gentlemen. Now, man, first of all, Pastor Kyle has done such an incredible job, and uh, we'll be sharing a little bit more next week about that. Now, he's not going anywhere at all. He's staying here at the Collective Church, but uh, we've been praying for Larry and Des for about a year. Uh, Larry, I've known Larry since he was 16 years old. He's 17 now, and... <laughs> Uh, Larry just moved here. Uh, what part of uh, Mexico were you guys in? Mexico. Mexicali. I knew it was Mexicali. No, it's Mexicali. It's still California. And so, um, and they were, he was a uh, creative director there on staff. Before that, he was on staff at another church in the South Bay as a youth pastor. And Larry's also been on staff with me at Hollywood as my creative director and in Sacramento. And so I've known Larry for years. And Desiree's also been a youth pastor and done incredible work. She's a PK, which means she's a pastor's kid. So she grew up in the church. And uh, we're sorry about that. I'm just kidding. <laughs> just kidding. I got four of them. Hey, but we're, we're excited. Uh, Pastor Kyle is, is going to be around for two months helping them in the transition. But uh, we're going to have an open house down at our collective headquarters. That's where youth takes place. It's our offices next to the Nile Theater where we used to have church. And so parents, teenagers, on the 25th of this month, it is a Sunday evening, we're going to have an open house. If you love to uh, meet them, greet them, if you have any questions for them, I've told them not to answer them. And Just kidding. <laughs> But uh, it's going to be a great time to come and support. So if you have a teenager, a junior high, or a high school, this is a good time. And so uh, I can invite some of our elders up to the stage so that we can pray for you as we commission you guys to be. Are you guys still sure you want to do it? All right, let's go. <laughs> he said, just don't give me a mic today. And so we have some of our elders. Carla, would you mind praying for this incredible couple, please? And Collective Church, if you feel comfortable, if you wouldn't mind bowing your heads and closing your eyes and maybe extending your hand just as a sign of agreement. Amen. Isaiah 43, 18 and 19 says, Do not remember the former things, nor consider the things of old. Behold, I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth. Shall you not know it? I will even make a road in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. So Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much, God, for the new thing that you're doing in Larry and Des's life, Lord. 
Thank you that you've called them here to the collective for such a time as this, God. Thank you for the anointing upon their lives, Lord. Thank you that you have prepared them, Father God. Even as a child, Father God, the things that you've put in their hearts, God, was for such a time as this, Lord. We thank you, Father, for the anointing. Thank you for the calling upon their lives, Lord. Thank you for the heart, God. Because that's what really matters is the heart, God. That they have the heart for the youth, Lord. I pray for a greater and greater level of love for you and for your people, God. I pray for the confidence that they need to go out and do the work, Lord. To reach the lost. To reach the prodigals, Lord. To reach those that are in distress, Father God. I thank you, Heavenly Father, for new levels of anointing over their lives, Lord. Thank you that no weapon formed against them shall prosper, God. And every tongue that rises up in judgment against them shall be condemned. So we thank you that um, the confidence is here and all insecurity is gone right now in the name of Jesus. Launch them forward. And the Lord says, I had to bring you back to launch you forward. So the Lord says, go forth in confidence, knowing that it is I that have called you. And I am sending you forth to do my will, says the Lord. Do not be afraid, for I am with you. I go before you, and I am your rear, God, says the Lord. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. And amen. Come on, let's give one more round of applause. Thank you. There's a little bit of love going on out here. We're Latinos, so that's how it goes. All right, no, for real, get off the stage, you guys. <laughs> hey, love you guys. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. No, I'm not. Hey, just kidding. Hey, uh, hey so we just ended a collection of talks uh, last week entitled Uncomplicated Relationships, and we're going to begin a brand new collection next week. I always like to leave a Sunday open just in case the Holy Spirit wants to do something and speak something. If the Holy Spirit ever wanted to change anything or a message, I would always do it. But today's a standalone message. Thank you, production team. We're going to be looking in the book of Genesis, and we're going to be looking at a life of a man, which if you've been in the church for some time, you're probably familiar with, and if not, that's okay. But a man by the name of Joseph. So we're going to start in Genesis chapter 37, verse 1. 1 through 11. And if you need a title, the title of today's message is The Five Tests of a Dream. Somebody write that down. The Five Tests of a Dream. Here it is. Genesis 37, 1 through 11. Now Jacob lived in the land where his father had stayed in the land of Canaan. This is the account of Jacob's family line. Joseph, a young man of 17, was tending to the flocks with his brother, the sons of Bilhah and the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives, and he brought their father a bad report about them. Verse 3, now Israel, or Jacob, loved Joseph more than any of his other sons because he had been born to him in his old age. And he made an ornamental robe for him. Now verse 4, when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than any of them, they hated him and could not speak a kind word to him. Now Joseph had a dream, and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him all the more. He said to them, listen to this dream I had. We were binding sheaves of grain out in the fields when suddenly my sheaf rose and stood upright while your sheaves gathered around me and bowed down to it. Verse 8. His brother said to him, do you intend to reign over us? Will you actually rule us? And they hated him all the more because of his dreams and what he said. Then he had another dream and he told it to his brothers. He probably should have stopped at that point, but anyways. He says, listen. I had another dream, and this time the sun and the moon and the 11 stars were bowing down to me. When he told his father as well and his brothers, his father rebuked him and said, What is this dream you had? Will your mother and I and your brothers actually come and bow down to the ground before you? His brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the matter in mind. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for what you've already done and what you've already established. I just pray, Lord, that you would move, that you would have your way. I, I ask that I would become less, Lord, and that you would become more. And I pray that the very words that are being spoken in heaven will be spoken here in this room, in this atmosphere, Lord. And I pray that our hearts would be open to what it is you want to speak to us. And I pray that wherever we are at on this journey of faith, whether we've walked with you all the days of our lives, whether we're new to the church, or whether we don't know you, and maybe we're skeptic, I pray that we would put aside any preconceived notions for just a moment to hear from you, Lord Jesus, to speak to our hearts. And we thank you so much for our children that are meeting in the buildings next door. We thank you for all of our children's pastors, our children's uh, crew leaders, Lord. We pray blessings over them, God. 
God, pray you give them strength. And we just pray that our children would just learn more about you today, Lord Jesus. They would continue to know and learn about the love that you have for them. We love you, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Everybody said amen. Let's give it up for James, ladies and gentlemen, on the keys. So, really quick, a couple of days ago, I posted a story on, I think it was Instagram or Insta story, I don't remember, but it was about my son, Mateo. And I don't know if you've ever had an opportunity to see my son running around here, but my son absolutely has energy for days and days and days. Like, it is nonstop. Like, I wish I could drink some of whatever he has. But he loves basketball. He's currently playing basketball. He plays basketball here at the Dignity Sports Complex. I am here five days a week. I've actually asked if they have timeshare available so that I can kind of just stay in this place. Man, but my son absolutely loves basketball. And a couple of days ago, he won two MVP awards here at the, we have the photos of that. He got two MVP. You know, I, I'm, I'm, I love all my kids. They all play sports or do some sort of activity. Now, he hasn't taken those medals off since about Wednesday. And so they stay. He wanted to wear them to school every day this week. And we're like, son, you probably shouldn't do that. He wanted to wear them to bed. Like, the kid has not let go of these uh, medals. But he has a dream. He wants to play in the NBA, like straight up. He wants to be in the NBA. And there's something about my son is that when he's focused on something, man, he goes 100. He's like his father. We just like zone in. And so all day from the moment he gets up to the moment he goes to bed, it is basketball, basketball, basketball. He's on the ESPN. Like this kid will run out of his room and he'll just ask me a random fact. Dad, Bobby, did you know that LeBron James is going to score 40,000 points in one minute? I was like, I have no, I didn't know, son. Oh my gosh, oh my gosh. Like, I'm supposed to, like, we're supposed to stop everything and clap and cheer. But, like, he just constantly is running around with stats. Like, he's out there practicing. We've got a basketball thing outside. He loves to practice. Man, he loves basketball. His dream is to be in the NBA. He actually said something to me, and Ashley was hilarious. He says, Poppy, I said, well, he said, if you could go to any place on vacation, any place, and you wouldn't have to pay for it. And he said, where would that be? I said, well, son, if I didn't have you four kids, I really wouldn't have to pay for it because... <laughs> I said, I go to the Greek islands. He's like, the Greek islands? He said, yeah. He said, Bobby, when I make it to the NBA, I'm going to take you there. And I was like, oh. He's like, Bobby, what's your dream car? I said, a G-Wagon, G-Wagon. Anyways, ha <laughs> You cochinos. And I said, a G-Wagon. He says, Bobby, when I make it to the NBA, I'm going to get you a G-Wagon. So if you see me pulling up in one, it's not church money. It's basketball money, Okay. I just want to get that out right here because some of you are already judging me. You're judging me when you want a Lamborghini, right? And so, but he's got this incredible dream. Now, here's the reality, man. I know my son has this dream, and I think that whatever he sets his heart to and his mind to, he has the ability to accomplish. The reality is that that dream is not going to just come overnight. There, there's going to be a process. <laughs> there's going to be so many things that he's going to have to go through. There's going to be so many experiences that he has yet to overcome. There's going to be so much growth, so much training. There's going to be moments of setback. There's going to be moments of comeback. There's going to be moments of ups. There's going to be moments of downs. He's going to have to go through a process in order to see that dream fulfilled. And here is the truth. I don't know if God has given you a dream. Has he? Maybe you have a dream of starting a business. Maybe you, you have a dream of writing a book. Maybe God gave you a dream that one day your children will serve the Lord who maybe aren't serving the Lord currently. Maybe God gave you a dream that you're going to be on staff at a church or that you're going to be a pastor. Or maybe God gave you a dream for something. I don't know, but God is in the business of giving dreams. And if he hasn't given you one, all you have to do is ask. The Bible, you have not because you ask not. But here's the truth. If God has given you a dream, you will have to go through a process. There is a process in between the moment that God gives you the dream to the moment of the fulfillment of the dream. And what happens is, is many of us never truly make it to the dream because we didn't take into consideration what it was going to cost us to do the process. Because in the process, you're going to experience ups and downs. Through the process, God is going to test you. We often think that when God gives it to me, it's going to be peachy king. Everything is going to be great. I'm just going to rise to the top. Everything is going to be smooth. I'm going to make money. Everything is going to be awesome, and I'm going to get it because God gave it to me. Usually, God gives you a photo with the end in mind, but doesn't show you how you're going to get there just yet. But oftentimes, we think it's going to be like this. This right here is you. See, it says this is you. Did anybody see that? This is you. 
right there, right? And this is your dream. Now, there is this vacuum and there is this space in between which we call a process in which so much hap- needs to happen. Oftentimes, we believe that God gives us this dream and that our entire a walk and journey to get there is just going to be this incredible straight line in where we rise to the top. And it's going to be that simple. Oftentimes, we think that that's what's going to happen, but the truth is, is it never happens that way. The truth is, whenever we set foot or whenever we step forth, even in our walk with Jesus, but even when we set forward to try to accomplish that dream, that's taking me back to the old school right here, you guys. Don't know nothing about that. I'm like up here just like having flashbacks <laughs> on the 405. Oh, I, look, I might have, I might not have. My parents are in the building. I can't neither confirm nor deny that I use my dad's van to do it. Okay, anyways. But oftentimes, the process looks more like this. You come up, and then you come down, and then you come down, and then you come up, and then up, and then something good happens. Oh, no, but it messed up again. Oh, no, but things are going good. Ah, but things go, oh, my gosh, I'm dizzy. I need a drama mean. And the entire journey looks like that. And this is the part where we get discouraged. Many of us will never make it to that because we get tired in this. Many of us will never make it to that because we get discouraged in this. Many of us will never make it to that because we spend too much time complaining about this. See, the truth is God will take you through a season or process or seasons of testing. When you look at the life of Joseph, God gave Joseph two dreams. The dreams essentially mirrored each other in the, in the fact of what was going to happen. Now, Joseph was 17 when he received that dream. Do you know how old he was when the dream came to fruition? He was 30 years old. That means it took between 12 and 13 years before Joseph actually was realized in the dream and had the opportunity to see it happen before his feet. But see, the truth is when Joseph received the dream, he wasn't ready for it at the age of 17. God would take him through a season of testing. God would take him through this process, about five tests that Joseph had to go through. Some people will preach this and they'll preach there's seven tests. Some people will preach that there's ten tests. I hate tests, so I'm going to preach the minimum amount of tests. Are you with me so far? Now, the first test that Joseph had to go through was the pride test. Now, Joseph wasn't very humble in this matter. The reality is that Joseph failed this, this test miserably. At 17 years old, going to his older siblings, going to his family, and telling them that one day that they will essentially bow to him almost in a form of worship. And not only telling them once, but telling him twice. See, here's the truth. When you have a dream, never share down, never share sideways, always share up. Because not everybody who's around you is a dreamer like you are. And sometimes you're surrounded by people who have broken dreams that the only thing they want to see is you never reach your dream. And so what, what, what Joseph demonstrated in the way that he said it and how he said it and as quickly as he said it, that he wasn't ready for the dream to come to pass. And his brothers hated him already. Now they hated him even more. And they hated him even more to the point that they wanted to kill him. But instead they beat him, put him into a pit, and they would sell him into slavery. What's your dream? Has God given you a dream? Every time you ask me how I'm doing, I say I'm living the dream, but you never know. That could be a nightmare or not, ladies and gentlemen. But your dream usually speaks to the end. It speaks about what's to come, not what's currently going to happen. And if you don't have the proper perspective to see it, you're going to end up missing it. Usually when God reveals a dream to you, you're not ready in that moment to sustain the weight of the glory that God wants to give you. Usually we're not in a place of maturity to be able to handle it, but God is showing you something so that it would encourage you along the journey. God will give you dream. God will give you revelation. But let me tell you, if you don't pass this test, eventually you can never move on to the next test. And many people get stuck in this place because they don't walk in true humility. For those of you who have a gifting of discernment, for those of you that have a prophetic gifting, for those of you that have a gift of intercession, usually your gift stumps and stays at the start and it never goes to the next place because you never truly learn how to walk in humility because the revelations that you receive you want to share them with everybody in the wrong timing so that you get the credit for it and instead of taking your discernment your spider senses that are tingling into prayer you take it into gossip some of you right here who are the greatest gossipers you probably are the greatest people with the greatest gift of discernment 
But because you haven't humbled yourself, you're stuck in a particular area. You don't believe me? Listen to the Apostle Paul. It happened to him in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7. Because of the surpassing greatness and extraordinary nature of the revelation which I received from God, for this reason, to keep me from thinking of myself as important, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan to torment and harass me, to keep me from exalting myself. Paul was a man who received incredible revelations, but God said, you know what? Too much of this revelation, my boy is going to get a little big-headed. And my boy's got a lot of work to do, like he's got to write a majority of the New Testament. So I'm going to send him a thorn, something that keeps him humble. Something that always comes him coming back to me. Something that always keeps him low and elevates me high. Something that constantly reminds him that the only reason he has these visions, the only reason he has this inspiration, the only reason he's able to do what he does is because it's me who gives him the ability to do so. You see, God desires to keep us humble. Humility is still a thing. Humility is not something something that you only exercise in church. You can exercise it in your business, in your workplace, in your school, with your people. Uh, 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 Humility is not a sign of weakness. It's a sign of strength, realizing that when you are weak, he is strong. Come on, that's a good place to give God praise. Now, before God gives you, he must humble you. He must take you through a process. And this is it. This is what James 4, 6 says. But he gives us more grace. That is why scripture says God opposes the proud, but he shows favor to the humble. See, your process will prepare you for what's on the other side. Now, the second test that Joseph needed to go to is what we call the Potiphar test. Now, Joseph already has been beaten by his brothers, has been thrown in a pit, and now they want to sell him to slavery. So Joseph is getting ready to go through another test. Now, Joseph had been taken down to Egypt Potiphar, an Egyptian who was one of Pharaoh's officials, the captain of the guard, bought him from the Ishmaelites who had taken him there. The Lord was with Joseph so that he prospered. And he lived in the house of his Egyptian master. Now when his master saw the Lord was with him, some, who asked me to share the Wi-Fi? Good grief. Who's trying to get on Instagram? Just kidding. When the master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord gave him success in everything he did, Joseph found favor in his eyes and he became his attendant. Potiphar put him in charge of his household, and he entrusted to his care everything he owned. From the time he put him in charge of his household and of all that he owned, the Lord blessed the household of the Egyptian because of Joseph. The blessing of the Lord was on everything Potiphar had, both in his house and in the field. So Potiphar left everything he had in Joseph's care. With Joseph in charge, he did not concern himself with anything except the food he ate. Now Joseph was well built and handsome, like your boy. No, I'm just kidding. (laughs) I didn't pass the pride test, you guys. I'm working on it. I'm working on it. What is the Potiphar test? Think about it. Joseph has just been beaten. Now he's, I got a dream, but I got beaten. I got sold into slavery, and now I'm at this dude's house, and now I got to sit here and serve him and serve everyone in his house. See, it could have been easy for Joseph to resent what had happened to him. You know why some of you will never achieve your dream or the dream that God has given you? Because you've allowed bitterness to take root in your heart instead of getting better. You've gotten bitter. You've allowed a particular experience or something that someone did or something that someone said or something that you went to, you've allowed yourself to hold on to that, to take root in your heart and to grow its entire garden so it does not allow you to proceed and move forward. So you are still stuck in one of the testing zones, ready to take off if you would pass it and go to the next level. But see, this would be a test to see if Joseph would be able to serve someone he didn't necessarily like. Someone who put him in a place that he didn't want to be. Someone who had authority to him. God wanted to see, Joseph, can you serve and build someone else's vision without causing division? Can you build and serve someone else's house before I take you to a place where I'll bring people to serve your house? Or will your dreams be so big in your head that you think that this is beneath you? Ha <laughs> ha! Some of you don't serve because you think you're too good enough and too big enough to actually get in there in the trenches and get dirty with the rest of the people because God's giving you a dream. The only way up with God is down first. Joseph, will you serve someone who is holding you essentially ransom? Will you, will you serve them as Colossians 3.23? Will you work with to him as you are working unto me? See, that was the test. Joseph could have rebelled. He could have tried to escape. He could have been bitter and allowed that. But you know, God will test you in that. God will bring you to a place before he gives you a dream. Can you serve someone else's vision? 
Can you serve that boss that you don't necessarily like? Or are you always leaving everywhere you go? The reason that some of you can't sustain a job or sometimes stay in a church is because you're unwilling to submit to a process that you put man in the place of, but it's really God that's allowing it. Some of you are upset with man or woman currently, and the person that you should be taking up with right now is God. Joseph could have been mad at Potiphar, but it was God uh, through Potiphar that was allowing some pruning to go in his life. Do you know that sometimes God will put you under bad leadership to prune out the bad leadership that is hidden in your heart that you didn't even know? You know that God will put you under a bad boss sometimes because in your heart, if he made you a boss right now, you would be bad. So he has to purge the bad out of you. And the reason that you can never elevate and go to the next level and get promoted is because you keep jumping from job to job to job to job to job to job, thinking that the boss is the problem. But my friend, maybe God brought you here so that I could tell you you're the problem. And the reason that you keep staying there and not getting elevated is because you keep trying to circumnavigate the test. You keep trying to blame everybody else except look within. Christians were great at that. We like blaming the rest of the world except looking within and taking inventory ourselves. My question is, can you serve someone else's vision even when you don't agree with them? Even when you think the way that they're doing it is the dumbest, stupidest, ridiculous way possible? Come on, how many of you ever been there? You looked at your boss and you were like, that is dumb, you are dumb, oh my gosh, this is all dumb. But well, you're still operating in pride. Can you walk in humility? You know, I was thinking about this sermon, and I was thinking about my parents, how they've stayed at the same job for like 20-something years, and they, they continue to show up on time. They left on time. They've worked hard. They've grinded. I don't think they ever came home one time and at dinner and said, my boss is the most incredible human being on the planet Earth. Oh, I love him. He's so great. No, but you know what they did? They knew that they had a task to do and they knew that they had someone they had to serve and they did it every day with a smile on their face and a praise on their lips that they actually had the ability to generate income for their family. And so my question is, so many, some of you need to learn to submit instead of always trying to split. Finish something for once. What you start, finish. The grass is greener on the other side. But I've also found out that the grass can be greener wherever you choose to water it. But you can't water something or a place when you haven't planted yourself in it. Are you still with me this morning? Yes, th three people. That was one of the tests. Many never pass this test, to be honest. Kind of end up staying there. And the third test that Joseph would go through is the purity test. In Genesis chapter 39, verse 6 through 9, it says this, So Potiphar left everything he had in Joseph's care. Now with Joseph in charge, he did not concern himself with anything except the food he ate. Now Joseph was well built and handsome. Okay, we got that. You already said that. Gosh. And after, what a jerk. That's why nobody likes you. No, I'm just kidding. Just kidding. <laughs> And after a while, his master's wife took notice of Joseph and said, come to bed with me. But he refused. With me in charge, he told her, my master does not concern himself with anything in the house. Everything he owns, he has he entrusted to my care. He said, no one is greater in this house than I am. My master has withheld nothing from me except you because you are his wife. How then could I do such a wicked thing and sin against God? Now, this was the test to see if Joseph would compromise, if Joseph would fall prey to his flesh instead of be sustained by the Spirit. And when Joseph was confronted with it, the reality is that he ran. Why? Because he feared the Lord more than anything else. Sometimes your sin issue has more to do with the fact that you really don't fear the Lord as you should. Having a healthy fear, not I am afraid of you, oh my gosh. But it is this reverence, this awe factor that says, hey, I can succumb to this, but because I fear the Lord, I'm going to choose not to. See, let me tell you what 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13 says. It says, no temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. 
And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. God will take you through a season where he will not tempt you. Satan will. And in that temptation, he will test you to see if you allow your flesh to, to arise or if you allow the spirit within you to put to death the things of this world and the things of this flesh. You have to understand that purity does not just mean sexual. It means having a clean heart, clean hands, clean conscience. It means walking upright. It means being righteous. What is righteous? Being in right standing with God. God doesn't want to see that you can skip with him for a couple of weeks and be on the straight path. He wants to see if you can walk an eternity with him on the road that leads to heaven, on the straight and the narrow path. Can you be a Christian for more than two weeks? Can you be a follower of Jesus more than on Easter? Can you be sustained? Because if you can't be sustained in God, then he isn't going to trust you with the dream. Because if he gives it to you, you'd probably quit like you quit on him how many times before? God wants to see what Joseph is made of. You got that grit, homie? You're fine and all, but let's see how strong that backbone is. When things aren't going your way, when people are coming against you, when people are lying about you, when temptation is knocking at your door, will you fold like the world or will you stand firm in my truth? You see, the reason this test didn't come first and it didn't come second and it came third, I believe that it took some time, is because initially Joseph wouldn't succumb to temptation. But you know what? The longer you go in discouragement, the longer you go in waiting because hope deferred makes the heart sick, the longer you go without seeing the blessing, the longer you go without receiving the accolades, the longer you go without getting the accomplishment, the longer you go, the wearier your soul becomes and the more... Uh, uh, um, What's the word I want to use? The more apt you are to falling prey to temptation. Notice that Satan tempted Jesus when he had already fasted the 40 days and 40 nights. He didn't go to Jesus on day one. He didn't go to Jesus on day two. He went to Jesus when Jesus was about to just like, oh my gosh, this is hard. Because he knew that he was at his weakest. You fall prey to temptation when you're at your weakest. And the question is, well, how do I overcome the temptation of purity? Well, Joseph, homeboy, ran. He's like, I'm gone. Nike hit him up for a deal. Like, he's out. If, if this building right now caught on fire, what would you do? Would you just stay there like, oh, my God, it's so warm. I love it. I'm just, I'm just waiting for the summer. I'm from Bakersfield. I'm used to this. Oh, my gosh. This isn't even heat, Right? What would you do? You would run out an exit sign. There's a way out. There's an exit sign. You would, you would go. The, this scripture right here is saying, hey, no temptation that you ever go through is going to overtake you unless you let it to. God has given you the ability to stand up under it and to overcome it and to have the victory in it. And sometimes you just got to flee. So God makes a way out. Will you take that way out? When temptation comes knocking at your door, see, God has to know that you're going to be able to continue to carry a righteous life. Not a perfect life, not a, a life that's, that's not marked without mistakes and accidents, but a, a life that is chosen to be lived in pure and it's in, in its purest form. We'll see, will you compromise? The fourth test is the prison test. Because now Potiphar's wife, she's mad. Because Joseph didn't say yes. She thought she had him. So now she accuses Joseph of rape. Potiphar comes back. Who's he going to believe? Joseph or his wife? He believes his wife. And this is what happens in Genesis 39, 20 through 23. Now Joseph's master took him and put him in prison. The place where the king's prisoners were confined. But while Joseph was there in the prison, the Lord was with him. And in every season and in every test and in every trial, the Lord was with him. He showed him kindness and granted him favor in the eyes of the prison warden. So the warden put Joseph in charge of all things held in the prison, and he was made responsible for all that was done there. The warden paid no attention to anything under Joseph's care because the Lord was with Joseph and gave him success in whatever he did. The prison test. The test of doing the right thing and landing in the wrong place. The test of being accused from someone you worked so hard for and someone that you respected. 
someone that you valued, maybe someone that you didn't actually like at first because they bought you as a slave, but they treated you so good that you had no other choice but to respect and revere this person. The, having to go through that place where your character is assassinated, where someone said something about you wasn't true and you stood up right and for the truth you are now confined to the prison of that place, the testing of the prison where you feel wronged, where you feel like you're in a place where you're neither moving forward and you're not going backward, in a place where you feel forgotten, in a place that can be dark. See, God wanted to know how Joseph would respond in this place because let me tell you something, the real test comes when you've been rejected, talked about, and cast aside for doing the right thing. Some of you can't handle that. Somebody said something about you. Your, cool, your trigger fingers turn to Twitter fingers. Thank you, uh, Jay-Z or whoever. That's Drake. That's Drake, the Apostle Drake. I don't listen to that, but I just heard, you know. I, just, I had heard from Ethan. And so um, assassination of your character. Some, some of you... Somebody says something about you, and you have to go run and put it on social media. Someone offends you, and you have to go and get the whole world on your back, sign 27 petitions, and then go out after that person and go for blood. What if that was God who allowed it? What if God allowed the hurt? See, what if God wanted to offend the mind because he needed to expose your heart? And the only way he could expose the heart was to offend the mind. And sometimes God will use situations like that to bring a great offense in your life. Have you ever been in that place, man, when someone said something about you that wasn't true? Maybe someone assassinated your character. I will tell you what's demonic. Stop fighting people. When someone assassinates your character, there is a spirit behind that, and you need to get behind it and rebuke it in Jesus' name. Have you been in that season or in that place where you feel forgotten? Maybe a leader. Maybe a pastor. Maybe a boss. Maybe a friend and you face such great rejection. Maybe you thought that you would be living the dream, but you feel like you're stuck in the prison right here. You're not moving forward in progress and you're not even going back, but you're just at a place of being at a standstill. Maybe you're at a place right now where you feel forgotten, like no one sees you, like no one even knows you exist. Like no one even cares that you are currently there. Maybe you tried to serve someone with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, with all your strength, and essentially they thought that you were trying to take their position. And they pushed you to the side and ridiculed you, and they said, and you had to walk in this place of loneliness and darkness and isolation. Well, I'm here to tell you it is in that darkness, in that loneliness, and in that isolation that God does his greatest work. In order for a picture to be rendered, it has to first go into the dark room, and then from the dark room it's brought into light. And it comes out better than when it first came in. So if you are in that process, put a smile on your face and a praise on your lips because you're on the way towards a dream. That's a good place to give God praise. Prison test. Most would give up. I wanted to give up there. I've been in that place. Man, let me tell you, ministry is not cute all the time. Okay, it's never cute, let's just be honest. I've been in that place. And you give something to someone and you serve them with all of your heart and you face the sense of rejection in that place of isolation. Your, your character is assassinated and you have to walk away quietly. You know why God will bless you? Because you walked away quietly. When David left under Saul's craziness, he left the castle quietly. But we live in a generation where we can't be quiet anymore. We have to say what's on my mind. I got to say what's on my heart. I got to say what's going on. And that's the test that you have to keep failing every time. God is saying, could you still walk in honor? Could you still walk in humility? Can you still turn the other cheek and allow me to get the vindication? See, some of you, the problem is the reason you're stuck is you want to vindicate yourself. You want to be justified in your eyes. You want everybody to know that you were right, that they were wrong, and whatever action or whatever situation is going on in your life, not realizing that our God is a God of justice, that our God is a God of vindication, that the one who gets the last laugh is God. That's the one, my friends. And if you would trust God in the testing, if you would trust God in the process that you will see in due time, he will raise you up if you you allow him to do it, and if you continue to serve and continue to move forward, are you still with me? Yeah. 
And Joseph's in this prison. And this cupbearer and this baker come. And they get thrown into the jail by the king. And they have these dreams. And Joseph helps him understand the dreams. And the baker gets killed. And the cupbearer gets uh, reinstated back into the Pharaoh's palace. And Joseph tells him, hey, remember me, dog. Remember me. You go up there. I'm your boy. He's like, I'm going to remember you. <laughs> no, I'm not. It's often a test of time as well. Here's the truth. When you don't deal with these situations well, when you don't even deal with church hurt well, because let's just be honest, a lot of you in here have probably experienced that. That's why you're struggling to break out of your shell and dive into the deep of this church because you're afraid that we are going to hurt you. You're afraid that I'm going to hurt you. Let me tell you something right now. In this church, you will get hurt. Somebody will hurt you. Somebody will say the wrong thing to you. Somebody might in the good spirits not realize that they did it. Someone might offend you, but that's life in general. Here's the truth, not intentionally, but here's the truth. We want to be like Jesus. Jesus, make me like you. Jesus, just don't take me to the process that had to makes me become like you, Jesus. Jesus had a Judas. Jesus has someone who hurt him from within. It's inevitable. It will happen. But the truth is, that doesn't mean that you close your heart off and you never open it up again. We deal in the people business. And we're not perfect. But if we love God and we choose to love people and walk in truth and in humility, then we can continue to move forward. But here's the thing. You've, you can't stay hurt. At some point, you have to understand that hurt is not a destination. It is a drive-through. But many of us have pitched a tent we started a little campfire. We got some s'mores. You got some horchata over here. Other, you, got, you got cider over here. We've got all kinds of things here. Multi-generational church, right? And, and you've, you've camped there, and you're like, I'm good. I'm going to stay here because it keeps me safe. It could keep you safe, but it keeps you from not growing and not going. And so the very thing that you are truly hurt and offended about, which you have absolutely every right to do and every right to be, instead of viewing it through the lens of the kingdom, you keep uh, viewing it through the lens of your carnality and to understand maybe God allowed, he allowed it for, what is the reason and can I move forward from this and come out on the other side better than when I came in so that maybe I never do this to someone it's funny, there's a book called A Tale of Three Kings by Gene Edwards, and it's this whole idea of telling the story, kind of like through a playwright of, of, of King Saul and King David, and there's this one, this one area, this one section that stood out to me, and it's probably because it's the only part of the book I read. No, I'm just kidding, I read the whole book a few times. But it says King Saul was jealous, King Saul was a hater on David, but it says that quite possibly it could very well be that the reason that God placed David under a king like King Saul was because deep within the very crevices of the heart of David was a King Saul himself. And the only way that God could get that out was to put someone over him that carried what was in him to pull it out. So that when he became the king, that he wouldn't treat people the same way. This is what Joseph is experiencing. He's going through hell and back. So when he gets in a position of leadership and power, so when the dream is fulfilled, he does not treat people the way that he was treated. Could that very well be that you went through what you went through, you're going through what you're going through, wherever context it is, because on the other side, God wants to elevate you to a place where you will one day have the authority to ensure that you don't do those same things over and over again. When you don't deal with it, though, it becomes bitterness. Bitterness is not the greatest cup to drink from because bitterness leads to resentment. And resentment leads to the need for justification. I gotta, I gotta justify myself. I gotta, I gotta be the one. I'm almost done. Isaiah 30, 18 says this, Yet the Lord longs to be gracious to you. Therefore, he will rise up to show you compassion. For the Lord is a God of justice, and blessed are those who wait for him. And blessed are those who wait for him. I don't know why I did that, but it just felt right. <laughs> He's going to show you compassion. He's a God of justice if you choose to wait for him. That's the test that we fail when we don't wait for him. 
That's the test that we fail when we don't wait for him. Worship team, if you can begin to come up. Now the last test, the fifth test, is the test of prosperity. The test of prosperity. Pharaoh has a dream. Cupbearer remembers Joseph two years later. It's like, you know what? Bring that guy up. Joseph interprets Pharaoh's dream. And here we are. Genesis 41, verse 41 through 43 and verse 46. So Pharaoh said to Joseph, I hereby put you in charge of the whole land of Egypt. Now that's a change up in itself right there. You went from being a prisoner and accused of rape to now you're in charge of Egypt. Second in command. And Pharaoh took a signet ring from his finger and he put it on Joseph's finger on the pinky ring. Amen. He dressed him in robes of fine linen and put gold chain around his neck. He had him ride in a chariot as his second in command. And people shouted before him, make way. Thus he put him in charge of the whole land. Joseph was 30 years old when he entered the service of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And Joseph went out from Pharaoh's presence and traveled throughout Egypt. 17, I get the dream. 30, when it comes to pass. Five tests in between. Failed the first, maybe passed the rest of them. Did he stay longer in certain ones because he didn't pass them before? Here's the thing. Sometimes what depends or what determines if you stay in one season longer than you should is your action and your reaction. How you choose to respond to the moment in the situation, that's when you sometimes feel stuck. God, why am I stuck? Sometimes it's God's like, hey, I, you could get unstuck if you were just to pass this test. But this was a test of prosperity, the blessing. Now this is where people forget about God. I guarantee you when Joseph was in the pits of hell as he fell, he was close to God. Oh, God, I'll, you get me? Lord, if you get me out of this prison, I will serve you for the rest of my life. How many of you done prayed that prayer somewhere, some, some, some moment in your life? God, if you heal this, I will serve you for the rest of my life. And God's like, okay, did you? Uh, he looks over at Michael. Michael, did you write that down? Okay, cool. Let's, let's, let's hook him up. And then God lifts us up, he blesses us, he gives us that dream, he gets us in that place, and then prosperity hits, and then all of a sudden we forget about God. And so the dream hadn't been fulfilled yet, he was still getting tested even in his blessing to see how he would respond, how he would treat people, how he would manage the finances and manage the blessing to make sure that he wouldn't treat them in a way that they should not be treated. Did Joseph forget everything that he went through? Did he carry it deep within his heart? And he tested him. There'll be moments when God blesses you. He puts you in that place. He provides. He heals the relationship. He restores the marriage. He restores the children. He does all of this. And in that, he's going to test you to see if you'll continue to love me. If you'll continue to serve me. You know what one of the hardest, I, I think I was sharing this with my staff the other day. I, I was saying, you know what the hardest thing as a pastor is? To walk through with someone through the valley of the shadow of death and praying with them and meeting with them for coffee, for lunches, and showing up for appointments and t picking up and, and you're walking someone or some people through the darkest parts of their life and then God does a miraculous work and brings them out. And then just as God brought them out, they're out. My genie lamp worked. I got my wish, I'm gone. The test of prosperity, when everything is going good, will you still continue to honor God? Will you still continue to serve the Lord? Will you still continue to seek Him the way you've been seeking Him? The same way you sought Him in the pit and in the prison. Well, when Joseph passed that test, Genesis 42, 6 says, Now Joseph was the governor of the land, and the person who sold grain to all its people. So when Joseph's brother arrived, they bowed down to him with their faces to the ground. That's it. Alas, the dream came to pass. After all this hell, 
after all of this hardship, after all of these setbacks, after all of these dark moments, after all of these ups, after all of these downs, after all of these places of hurt, after all these places of isolation, out of all these places of rejection, after all these places of insecurity, after all these places of feeling forgotten, out of all these places, God, finally, you brought it to pass because he trusted God. So my question to you is, Will you trust God on the way to whatever it is that he's promised you? Whatever the dream that he's given you, would you trust him? Would you submit to the process? Would you submit to what he has for you and what he's taking you through? Because this, uh, this is what Philippians 1.6 says, I am convinced and confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will continue to perfect and complete it until the day of Christ Jesus and the time of his return. Why don't you stand at your feet? There's a promise that you can take to the bank. That the God who began a good work in you, he's going to finish it. But check this out. He won't finish it unless you allow him to finish it. Will you say, God, what you started in me, I'm calling you to complete and the beauty of it is, is that Jesus goes with you all the way. He journeys with you all the way. With every head bowed and every eye closed. If you're in here this morning, and maybe you need Jesus for the first time. Or maybe you need Jesus because it's been a long time. The Bible says the only way to the Father is through the Son. The Son Jesus. The only way for us to have life and life in the full is through Jesus. And maybe today you need something greater than yourself to save you from yourself. Or maybe today you need to come back to Jesus. I'm not saying that he ever left you, but maybe you need to come back and allow him to finish that work that he started in you. With every head bowed and every eye closed, if you need Jesus today, would you lift your hand? Anybody need Jesus today? Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Anyone else? Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Anyone else? Anyone else? Thank you. Anyone else? Thank you. Anyone else? Thank you. Anyone else? Thank you. Anyone else? Anyone else? Just can put your hands down. This isn't magic, this isn't hocus pocus, but the Bible says this, if you believe in your heart and you confess with your mouth, you will be saved. But all you have to do is invite him into your heart and then take that next step to continue the journey or start the journey. If you don't have a church, we'd love to be your church. But I want to go ahead and pray with you. With your head bowed and eye closed, if you, pr if you raised your hand in your own very way, all you have to say is, Jesus, I invite you into my heart. I invite you into my life. And I believe that you died on the cross just as we heard through communion, and that you rose on the third day so that I can have life and life forevermore. So Jesus, from this day forward, I give you my life, or Jesus, I'm coming back to you so that I can continue in this life. I might not know the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, but what I do know is that you love me and you died for me, and I choose to live for you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, come on, let's give a round of applause to all those who prayed that prayer.